Hi, my name is Paul Downing. This is my Landsair 360. It's an all fiberglass home built airplane built in 1994. Uh, I've had it about a year and a half now. And uh, take you guys on a walk around here. So it's got power plant. It's a 0360 carbureted uh, metal prop, uh, constant speed there. So it's all fiberglass. I do race this airplane at Reno. So you'll notice some things as we walk around, such as uh, gap seal tape here, uh, sealing the gap between the stub wing and these outer wing panels, which are removable. Three fuel tanks. Uh, wings are each 21 gallons a piece. Uh, there's a header right up there. It holds eight and a half. Uh, these are the extended wing tips, which was an option uh, from Lancer. And not very many pe uh, of the Lancers have these, actually. Most of the time you'll see the wing tip will come out to about here and it's uh, bonded on. So mine's unique in the fact that these wing tips are removable. And since I was racing at Reno, these longer wing tips are a little slower in the lower altitudes, uh, faster supposedly up in the higher teens. I usually didn't go up there, so they really don't help a whole lot for what I'm doing. So before Reno this year, I made some wing tips that were came to about here I uh, made them out of fiberglass. Uh, so I cut off about four feet of total wing. Sped me up a little bit, not entirely sure how much, but the biggest notice, or biggest change I noticed was increase in roll rate. Do have uh, built in landing lights, which I haven't seen on any of the other Lancer 360s. Most of the time they're up in the, the cowl, up in the nose, or actually sometimes people put them down here on these uh, little landing gear. Uh, legs so from what I've noticed looking at pictures online and other uh, seeing other planes in person these actually work a little bit better than uh, down on the landing gear you get to see a little more out there uh, another speed mod you'll notice here is gap seal tape uh, this actually is for gliders and notice a lot of people are putting them on everybody at Reno pretty much has sealed their gaps um, People say they get five to seven knots. I'm not sure if I actually got that much, but uh, it's all about those micro knots. Got uh, electric flaps. I need to go. Right now they're actually negative eight degrees, so this is reflexed for cruise flight. So, uh, and it's you know the fairing set for that. Take off with a uh, little bit of flap. What I do is put the aileron all the way to the side and mash the flap up with it. That's uh, pretty much what everybody does. You go down to I believe. 40 degrees and like I said they're electric. Right now I'm a first officer at Envoy Airlines and I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to gain their sponsorship for racing this year at Reno. So they were uh, very helpful and helping me get the time off and supporting me to race this year. Over here we got my crew chief Landon. Uh, I went to college with him. He's an AMP. He works for Pratt and Whitney right now. Uh, my sister came out and helped him with support, and uh, my dad's an AMP, uh, helps with, as you can see, everything else here on the airplane. Got my rescue sk stickers here. Hopefully, I'll never need them uh, at Reno, but they're there so that way they, the rescue team knows how to get into the plane and get me out. Another sponsor I got here, uh, Air Capital Insurance. They uh, gave me a discount on uh, insurance for racing. Unfortunately, uh, you got to buy extra insurance for that, and it's not cheap. My race number here, 36. Nothing special about it. Just one that was available, and that's what I got. Back to the tail. Nothing real special going on here. Uh, more gap seals on the uh, elevator rudder on uh, both sides. Another thing that is a little unique about this airplane is I do have this extra dorsal fin down here. Most of the Lancer 360s, all the other ones I've seen, the fuselage ends where this extra dorsal fin comes down. So it gives me a bigger rudder and uh, as a byproduct of that it had to have a lot more weight up here. So if you look at it from the front view, this counterbalance is uh, its just full of lead so it actually bubbles out a little bit so they can get the, the balance of it right. Got electric trim on the rudder. Uh, the elevator or pitch trim uh, you'll see when you come around that there's no 
there's no uh, trim tab on it. So how this works, and I'll show you more in the cockpit, but it has a spring tensioner that basically kind of moves the, the neutral point of the stick. Um, these airplanes are known for kind of being notoriously really sensitive in pitch. Uh, so some people are scared of them, but with some proper training and just a little, you just fly it a little bit, you get used to it, it's not a big deal. Basically same thing on this side. Uh, only difference is on this wing we got electric roll trim here on the aileron. Another fuel tank, like I said, it's basically the same. Do have another rescue sticker. My name on the side. All the racers have to have that. Um, NACA air vent for cabin cooling. Got a much larger NACA vent here for the oil cooling oil cooler uh, it works really good actually it works a little too good uh, when it's cold out here you know in the winter time like it is right now I actually had to tape it up because uh, I can't get my oil temp up so like I was running like 110 degrees so way too cold so I had to tape it up like I said I got this uh, big box down here that's the uh, carburetor hangs down here don't know why it's so big all the other ones I've seen even carbureted ones have a lot they don't have near as much hanging down here so that's uh, one thing I'm gonna address this this uh, winter during speed mod season to increase my aerodynamics like I said uh, new engine I bought uh, came with cows new cows so they're uh, much more aerodynamic all right, so this is the tip-up canopy. There is a, this is a more desirable option on the Lancers. The other one is, uh, the whole canopy just kind of lifts up and moves forward. So it kind of, you have to take the canopy off basically to do any work behind the instrument panel. And this one you can do a fair amount with the canopy still attached. Another unique thing, which I didn't know was unique until I took it to Oshkosh uh, last year was there's a inertia wheel, kind of like you'd have, well, like on a seatbelt, um, because these canopies, it doesn't, mine doesn't lock down. You have to latch it from the inside. The later models had a handle on the outside. Uh, mine doesn't have that, so there's no way really to lock it other than with a key. And so what can happen is the wind can catch these, flip them up, and either break them off or damage the attach points. So this helps prevent that by if the canopy is moving real quick, this is going to stop it. So there's actually a few people at Oshkosh came by last year and took some pictures of this and looked at it and thought it was a really neat deal. Standard six pack. I have a Vision Microsystems uh, instrument instrumentation for the uh, all the engine uh, data. Some things I want to talk about here, speed wise. If you look here, the bottom of the white arc is at uh, 65 miles an hour. So that's our stall speed and uh, dirty configuration gear and flaps down and the bottom of the green stall speed clean would be a hundred miles an hour so it does have a kind of a high stall speed uh, especially compared to like your RVs things like that but this is also a lot faster playing uh, normally plan to cruise oh uh, usually around 10 so like 9500 maybe 10 5 800 or 8500 plan for about 195 knots uh, there are some faster ones like I said I hope to be a little faster after I do the engine and cowling change. Uh, gear speed is a uh, 140 miles an hour, 120 knots. Um, that's really the only limitation. There's not like a gear up limitation like you might see on some other aircraft. This is the pitch trim right here. It's got a wheel and there is a uh, little indicator here for your neutral but this actually you can see moves the center point of the, the stick where it's neutral and it's spring loaded and you can't see it because there's a little uh, tray in here but there's uh, springs on the that moves this center point of the stick like I said it is a little pitchy um, Another thing you notice, my prop knob is part way out, and that was because I adjusted the governor before uh, Reno this year to spin more than 2,700 RPM. What I was looking for was less than 3,000, but uh, what I ran up was 2,900 RPM. So it's part way out right now because uh, after I landed, I don't push it all the way in just in case I have to go 
do a go around it's not gonna you know super over rev the engine so prop knobs out a little bit and that's how I take off with it and cruise I run it at 2400 rpm and whatever manifold pressure I can get and the prop knob is way out here I right, talk a little bit about uh, what I'm looking at when I'm racing majority of it is outside where you know as low as 50 feet as high as 250 feet so usually I'm sitting around 60 or 70 feet um, looking at other racers if I'm coming up on somebody you know it's it's formation flying so I'm trying to I'm definitely making sure I don't hit them but also trying to you know make a move to try and get around them get in a good position when there is some spots uh, during the race where there is opportunities to look inside what I'm looking at is uh, some parts I'll get, glance at the altimeter just kind of see where I'm at the, the course isn't level it, the terrain changes so uh, it's 50 foot AGL so just kind of glancing at that just seeing you know what it's reading basically it's probably just a habit from you know normal flying is you know kind of glancing at the altimeter every so often the other thing is obviously engine stuff um, want to make sure everything's looking pretty good there when I was racing uh, my cylinder head temps were actually staying pretty cool for running it so hard it was about 390 400 degrees which I thought was pretty good don't have a problem with oil temp although I'd look at it just to make sure uh, you know the main, uh, bearings not going out and it was getting ready to dump all its oil same thing oil pressure it's right here on one gauge so that's pretty nice so it's basically kind of looking at uh, my cylinder head temps didn't care too much about exhaust gas temps what the fuels doing and uh, oil um, like I said I do have a header tank and I got the two wing tanks uh, what I would do would be always take off and land on the header tank it's gravity fed it's closest to the engine and for the rejoin and getting set up to get uh, onto the race course um, this one's pretty unique also I haven't seen a whole lot of 360s set up this way but I can run it either off the header or the wing tanks um, so most 360s are set up to only run off the header tank and I got a couple switches over here for the left fuel pump and right fuel pump and so the left wing has a fuel pump that is set up to refuel the header right wing um, goes directly to the engine but there is a gravity cross flow to balance the wings um, so the nice thing is if one of these pumps came out and I was flying cross country or something I'd be able to get all the fuel out versus the traditional setup how the build manual states would be if you had a pump go out that fuel is just trapped in that wing and you'd have to land and figure it out so that's pretty nice do you have a fire extinguisher back here not only is it just a good idea to have one but I was also required to have one for racing at Reno but the 360s with these small gear it's very important to have a spare tire and tube um, as you see these are kind of pretty small tires and I've had two flats actually I take the back I've had three flats one was in Chicago and on the runway course it cost like 300 bucks to get towed off the runway then I, I had a tire and tube and I didn't have time to change it myself so I had some uh, a local maintenance shop change it there another time um, landed somewhere south of Springfield Missouri got a flat tire is Easter and uh, luckily my dad knew somebody in the area I had a spare tire and tube actually I take it back I'd already used the tire I just had one more spare tube uh, I actually had two tubes and these are actually really easy to pinch when you change them and I told him that well the guy pinched it so luckily I had another tube and we put that one on took off flew back home landed got another flat tire and basically what it was is the wall in this in the tire that I had at the time was just rubbing on them and rubbing on the tube and when I landed it just went flat again so I always got a spare tire and tube now when you race do you take all this stuff out yeah I take it all out okay just uh, to try to lighten it up yeah uh, awesome. I don't like take out any seat cushions or anything like that um, but the big it's not really so much the weight of the stuff it's it getting thrown around because um, you're flying in and out of people's wake and it can be rough you know it's summer and the high desert with mountains so it you're, can be uh, you're low and bouncy and yeah yeah and like I said you're light so it's gonna throw you around even more talked about the gear being hydraulic hydraulic pump is in the passenger seat back and we can actually get to it real easy so it's just a little panel back here got our hydraulic pump 
batteries in there. Uh, when I first bought this, I was flying it back from Virginia and uh, landed for gas. Everything was going great. I had flown it like the previous two or three days. Went to start it and it powered up and everything, but as soon as I hit the starter, it just stopped. And uh, I have a volt amp meter and I didn't notice anything weird with it on the flight, but what ended up happening was the battery I had in there, it was a Concord, it had been in there for I think almost five years and went bad and luckily I happened to land about 30 minutes from uh, Jabiru aircraft and so they ended up having this Odyssey battery that they put in their Jabiru's and I was able to drive up there and buy it off of them and put it in and make it the rest of the way home so yeah. I seem, always seem to break down on Easter, so hopefully, uh, hopefully I break that this year. Um, the rest of it, maintenance-wise, it's actually fairly easy to work on. These seats just pull right out. The fans also pull right out, and you can see uh, hydraulic. This is actually the gear door hydraulic valve right here. You can see the controls fuel line coming in from the uh, right wing, Just some more hydraulic lines, power cables, brake lines, and uh, wires for the strobe and micro switches for the gear and gear doors. Uh, other than, you know, it's kind of small so sometimes it's kind of a pain to work on stuff, but most of the things are actually pretty easy to get to, especially... Uh, Especially this hydraulic pump that we talked about previously. Some guys were putting those way back in the tail and there's not a whole lot of room back here in this baggage area to crawl back there and service it. So this is pretty nice because uh, I had my micro or these uh, pressure switches go out and I think they're the original ones honestly. This airplane only has 500 hours on it and when I bought it it had 300. So kind of been working out all the bugs since I uh, hadn't flown a whole lot in its uh, lifetime so now it's running great though I think I've pretty much worked everything out but I'm planning on uh, redoing this panel also at the same time I do the engine uh, I got a 430 I'm gonna stick in and purchase a G3X touch system so I'm really looking forward to that uh, my bank account's gonna suffer though <laughs> this stuff's expensive the guy that owned this aircraft previously um, his name is Rick Vandom, and uh, he's real big into the racing scene, and he actually lives in Reno, uh, retired airline pilot. He mostly races in the jet class, but he was one of the founding members of the sport class, and he had this airplane. I'm not entirely sure of its whole history. Um, I know that the guy that built it has passed away. Um, I believe he donated it to Museum, who later sold it, and it's raced a few times at Reno. Uh, I heard they used it on a military contract to chase drones um, somewhere in Nevada. And it was in Virginia when I bought it, and another racer had it, Andy Finley, and flew with him a bunch in it. and. Got to see his super legacy that he races, and uh, he was like, "Oh yeah, this plane's raced before. You should uh, look into it. It's a lot of fun." And we became friends and kept in contact, and uh, went out and visited him in May of this year, and got warmed up on all the formation, all the maneuvers, because he's also an instructor. And went out to rookie school in June, and got through rookie school and got a race this year. So. Uh, Got to thank Andy for for that, and uh, also this new addiction. So it's expensive. You know the old saying: how do you end up with a small fortune? In yeah, aviation? start with a large one. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, there's no money to be made in racing. It's uh, just all fun. What's it like? Where? What was it like being your first year? First year, a little intimidating, uh, for sure. But uh, when I was in the plane, actually racing, you know, it was just. I mean, just focused on the mission, you know, I'm trying to obviously be safe, that's the number one thing, but fly low, turn left, fly as fast as possible, you know, try to get around some people, and uh, in the moment, you know, it was just pure focus, and I'm just flying this airplane, you know, doing what I'm trying to do. It wasn't until after you land, and, you know, 
we'd all debrief after each race that uh it was like oh man that was that was awesome you know having a good time out there and everyone's good buddies um i was about to say the camaraderie's got to be yeah really, yeah really good. i mean you got you know you got to trust each other also because you know we're flying formation and yeah we're racing but uh no one wants to see anybody get hurt so everyone's really cool out there a really good group of guys how's the uh, guys. how's the training for out there Pretty the training cool. so uh you have to show up with uh comfortable in a four ship formation and i believe the first two or three days was just warm up uh we take off in groups usually flights of four uh practice uh rejoins um breakout maneuvers different uh formations you know echelons and uh, the welded wing things like that uh big focus was on the rejoins and we also had to do maneuver um called the upset recovery demo or the flip-flop which is where you take the plane you roll it completely inverted and then you got to roll it back out without losing any altitude and the reason for that is because flying through a lot of people's wake turbulence everybody's turning left you're gonna hit a wake and it's gonna roll you into the ground and you're low enough that uh, you can't keep the roll going so it's to, uh, to roll out so I got into some wake turbulent several times and at one point I was in a 90 degree bank and I had to stick all the way to the the ride and it wasn't it wasn't rolling of course I got out of it then it snapped right over but uh, it's interesting um, definitely learn to avoid the wakes as much as you can so find a better line trying to be faster I mean so it's all about being smoother and uh, hopefully placing better so it's all about going fast so this year there was eight you finished seventh? Seventh out of eight. So there was, it's broken down into different heats because the sport class is pretty much unlimited. The only limiting thing is you gotta have internal combustion engine less than a thousand cubic inches. Uh, there's guys out there running nitrous, turbochargers, superchargers, wide variety of airframes. A lot of, a lot of Lancers, I think about half were Lancers and most of those were Lancer legacies. Um, so it's broken down based on speed. They have the gold group, silver, bronze, and then medallion. So I was in the medallion, which is the slowest grouping of uh, aircraft. So was, uh, let's see, I think there was three 360s, a 320, Lancer 320, which is the same airframe, just 320 cubic inch engine. And there actually was a, a Super Legacy. And there was a couple RV-8s and uh, F1 rocket. Those like, rockets are pretty quick. Yeah. They're probably not as quick as this. But. Nah, that one was faster than me. So. Really? Yeah. Wow. The one that was there. And so, the RV, RV8s are fun, but they're not that fast. Well, they were running right. nitrous. Oh, really? They were all running nitrous, so... Uh, no kidding. They were faster than me also. I was, I thought it was great in practice. I was uh, flying by them, but uh, come race day, uh, they had all this more speed, so... Whatever. Because practice days, they're, they're not wasting the money on the nitrous. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they had lots of nitrous. Wow. So what kind of preparations as far as uh, flying are, are you going to be doing as far as that? Is, is there any preparation? Yeah, flying? formation flying. The more formation fly, flying you can do, you know, the more comfortable and better at it you are, the, the easier it is for racing. Um, probably practice, you know, the upset recovery demo more times. And... Those are the big things. I mean, it's it's all formation flying. The racing is formation flying. It's just what they call uncooperative formation. So unlike normal formation, the, the guy that you're trying to get around that you're flying off of is not trying to make it easy for you. So it's a little bit different. Now, as far as passing, what there there's rules for that. Yeah, there's passing. Uh, normally, you got to be you got to pass on the outside. Um, so and. Obviously, you can't just cut right, just right in front of somebody. Um, although the rule is just nose to tail separation, so you could do that. On the corner, so it's got to be 100 feet in opening uh, when you're pulling in front of somebody. So, so you got to pass on the outside. Yeah, you got to pass on the outside. Doesn't matter if you're high or low? Or? Uh, no, you just go hit them. Uh, and we do talk on the radio, be like, hey, you know, I'm on your right. You use each other's race numbers and say, hey, I'm on your right. And uh, usually when you get up there, uh, they don't have to, but they will sometimes call you clear and let you know. Then you, know, you can pull it in, and it's not on you to 
not hit the guy, basically. He's he's flying off you at that point. Kind of a courtesy thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So some people think of it different. They're like, you know, it's racing. You know, why would I call somebody clear? But sometimes, you know, if they're passing you, passing you, you know, I can't. That's just how it is, so.